Hi students, welcome to Year 12 Biology and Module 5, Heredity. This is video number 3 and we're going to very quickly skate through plant reproduction. This learning intention is a follow-on from the ones we've previously looked at. Uh, again, about the mechanisms of reproduction that help ensure continuity of the species by analysing sexual and asexual methods of reproduction and specifically relating to plants. So when you're looking at uh, what you want to try and put together from this video and from the work that's involved in looking at plants, we want to make sure that we can identify a number of different ways in which plants reproduce, that we can uh, describe sexual and vegetative reproduction in plants, and to be able to assess the conditions that affect the reproductive strategies of plants and determine their efficacy or effectiveness. One of the interesting things about plants is that plant groups are primarily distinguished by one of two things, the presence or absence of transport vessels like xylem and phloem, and also by their reproductive strategies. And in this particular video, we'll focus in on some of these reproductive strategies to analyze um, these four important plant groups. I've left algae off this particular list um, so I just want to focus in this particular video primarily on the last of these groups, but on the four groups which can be distinguished primarily by their reproductive strategies. Now bryophytes are the simplest plants. Uh, this includes things like mosses and liverworts. They have no uh, vascular tissue and as a result of that they're very, very small. Uh, they don't grow very large and of course they uh, need to remain moist uh, constantly. So mosses dry out and they, they don't tend to survive particularly well. So, um, so that affects the way that they reproduce. The reproductive strategies that they select are fairly simple. And one of the things that we do uh, probably need to mention at this point is that for most of this, uh, these different plant groups, they do have uh, at least the potential to have both uh, sexual and asexual components to their life cycle and often it's the conditions that determine which of those is preferred. Pteridophytes are the ferns and they're the first of our vascular plants or tracheophytes and um, and you know that ferns can grow to a reasonable height. They do have supportive structures that don't that have the um, same arrangement of xylem and phloem as we see in other uh, in other plants. Um, and ferns are probably characterized by the presence of spores. If you turn the little fronds over, you can often see, certainly during the reproductive phase, you can see the little tiny spores uh, looking like little brown uh, dots on the underside of the fronds. And that is one of the ways in which ferns reproduce. In fact, we'll have a look at those uh, when we go for a little wander around the school campus to see if we can find some ferns and hopefully to see if we can find some that have uh, spores present. The uh, next group of plants are the conifers. Uh, think pine trees and these reproduce with cones and there's a little example uh, on the uh, uh, an image on the slide that we have here. So gymnosperms reproduce by cones. So that's a, a third, if you like, type of reproductive strategy. And the final one, and the one that we're probably most familiar with, are the flowering plants, which are the gymnos, uh, which are the angiosperms, and they reproduce uh, through flowers. Now again, they don't exclusively reproduce by flowers. Flowers are their sexual organs of reproduction, but we will also look at a number of uh, asexual means of reproduction that we see in um, many different plant groups, including the flowering plants or angiosperms. So there's a, quite a range of different strategies that plants uh, do use for reproduction. You can see here are the spores that I was talking about earlier on the underside of the fronds. Uh, of ferns, so fern fronds, one nice easy way to do it. And if you can see these little um, spores sitting underneath the fronds, uh, then you can usually use just a little piece of sticky tape to um, attach them to a slide and to have a look at their structure. Grasses uh, will often use the asexual means of runners to extend um, the plants and extend them along 
the ground or just under the surface of the soil. Uh, and that's a way that, that new uh, leaves can spring up. And it's a, it's a, and don't forget the thing with asexual reproduction strategies is that usually we're, we're about rapid growth. So certainly uh, in, in predictable environments where you know that um, certain resources are available and you can take advantage of those resources if you can reproduce quickly, that's a great place for this type of reproduction. Tubers, uh, again, think things like potatoes, uh, corms and rhizomes are other structures. Uh, lignotubers is something that we also see uh, under the ground near the uh, roots of plants that can um, spring up and regrow, particularly if things like fires come through. Each of these are structures or strategies that the plant can use for rapid repopulation or uh, growth expansion through asexual means. So no coming together of, of gametes here, but just structures that are within the plants that can then lead to the growth of a new individual. But asexual strategies are not the only strategies that plants use. The other thing that plants use are sexual strategies and one of the probably most impressive of the sexual strategies that plants use are flowers and we will certainly have a look at some examples of flowers to see if we can see things like the um, female part of the pistil which will include uh, also called a carpel uh, which will include the stigma and style and you can see one kind of down the bottom here um, Probably need to just give you a different colour to look at that right there. Um, but also the um, male parts of the flower as well. So plants are, plant flowers tend to be hermaphroditic. They have both male and female parts. They're not always present um, and mature at the same time in order to try and prevent self-fertilisation. You also um, see that the there's a difference in the position of the uh, male parts. The anthers are the uh, little ends here, and they sit on filaments, and together they form a stamen, which is the male part uh, of the plant, and the pistil is the female part of the plant. Now, the problems for sexual reproduction is what we've talked about before, which is you've got to get the male gamete to the female gamete. Um, that process happens through pollination in plants, so the pollen moving from the anther to the stigma, and then um, the uh, pollen basically creates a pollen tube, and we have the sperm fertilizing uh, the egg in the ovule. Once that happens and the seed starts to develop, then you also have the problem of seed dispersal. What happens to those seeds? Where do they go? Um, how are they moved from one place to another? It's not going to be good for the plant if all of the seeds drop into the same soil that they're already using for nutrients. They'll be competing with their own offspring. So the idea is to get the seeds to move a little further away. And again, um, wind and animals can be used in order to help those seeds disperse. And also, it's the strategy about fruits, which we find for angiosperms, or cones, which we find for gymnosperms. Now, this is a big area plant, so I've kind of tried to, to run you through it very quickly. I think what we will do is have a little bit more look at the structures in flowering plants and see if we can understand how sexual reproduction occurs in flowering plants. But I thought it would be useful to give you just a quick introduction to those other groups of plants as well, and the fact that each of them is often characterised by differences in their way of uh, reproduction. Thanks for watching.